Good morning, everybody. My name is Sriram. Uh, I am a professor of computer science at Brown University. Um, and uh, basically what I'm trying to do is to uh, dispel the large amount of confusion that is out there about PhD applications. Um, I'm gonna do my best today. Uh, and what I'll do is I've uh, organized uh, all the questions that you asked a priori, which as I said in my email is most of the questions I typically get. I've been doing these kind of info sessions for students at Brown for 20 years now. So I thought it'd be a good thing to just take it on the road and make it open to everybody. And at the end of this, we're gonna take the recording of this and put it on YouTube. So I just want you to, be, to remember that. Uh, I do want you to feel free to ask questions. I'm not gonna share the chat. So if you ask questions confidentially in chat, nobody will know that you asked them so you can feel free. Uh, but for now, I'm gonna request that maybe you hold questions because I do have several things to get through. Um, I, I've, got a, uh, I've got some organization here. Um, normally, I like to do this a lot more interactively, but uh, it's a little hard to do the interaction when we've got so many different people. Uh, the exciting thing for me was we got signups from uh, literally all over the world. We've got every continent represented. Uh, uh, so there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, not only countries, but also continents and people that fit various kinds of diversity, um, various kinds of diver uh, diverse criteria. So it's really exciting to have you all here and thank you for coming. Okay, so what I, I so let me also say that what I'm gonna give you is essentially my personal perspective uh, if you ask, you know, five professors for their opinion, you'll get about seven or eight opinions. So uh, we're all a very opinionated bunch. So I'm not going to say that this is exactly how everything works everywhere. Uh, what I am hoping to do at some point is to also write up all of this and then get some feedback from colleagues at other universities, and then I can correct it as we go along. Uh, so this is somewhat my opinion, but I don't think I'm completely wrong or I wouldn't be doing this. And, uh, you know, it's advice that I've given to several students over the years and seems to work pretty well. So take, take it for what it's worth. Okay. Um, I am assuming that, so first of all, I'm talking about PhD programs in computer science in the United States. And I'm, and I'm doing this very, uh, this narrowing because I think if you take out any one of these variables, things start to vary a lot uh, to the point where I'm not even sure I can say with any authority what happens. So I would be creating, you know, misinformation, which is the very thing that I'm trying to combat here. Uh, and even here, there's a fair bit of variation, okay? In the United States, I would say roughly speaking, um, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't uh, spend any of my time looking at rankings and things like that. But, th but there's, you know, a handful of schools, four or five institutions, you know, sort of, you know, like MIT and Stanford and Berkeley, CMU, places like that, that are super competitive. Then there's a bunch of, you know, uh, uh, highly competitive places like Brown and several peer schools. And then there's places that are less competitive and places that are really not very competitive. Okay. I'm going to assume that if you're on this call, the reason you're here is because you're interested in one of the more competitive places. So things that I'm saying here may not apply to every institution. In fact, probably won't apply to every institution. But I'm trying to give you the perspective of somebody who is, you know, I've been at Brown 20 plus years. I've done lots and lots of PhD admissions here. Uh, I also have a sense from talking to colleagues about how it works at similar places elsewhere. I'm trying to give you a sense of what it takes to get into one of those kinds of places. Um, if a place is really not very competitive, most of this may not apply. Okay. All right. What I would like to do is I would like all of you to please use the raise hand reaction so I know you can hear me and hopefully see me clearly enough. Whether you can see me or not doesn't matter to me. Uh, you may have your uh, video off for bandwidth reasons, whatnot. But please use raise hand because I want to make sure you can actually hear me clearly. And if there's any problems, I want to be able to debug that before we go along. So I'll wait for a moment for everybody to raise their hands, please. You can applaud. You can use whatever, whatever emotion you want. I don't really care. It's fine. Uh, okay, I'm getting a lot of different ones. Okay, I think just about all of you can. Um, can you please lower your hands now, please? Thank you. Uh, I think I can probably do that automatically, maybe uh, not really. Okay, so, okay. Um, all right, so if anybody is having a problem with audio, can you raise your hand right now? A problem that I can solve, uh, not, a, not at your end. Okay, I think we're good. Uh, if you want to turn your videos on, you're more than welcome to. Uh, it's sometimes nice to not talk to a box, but uh, whatever you're comfortable with is fine by me. Okay. All right. So let's get started. You have lots of questions. 
let me start by giving you a high level way of thinking about the question of admissions, okay? Um, this is a perspective that you don't usually get because this is in some sense, this is a professor's perspective. And in some sense, many of the questions that you have can actually automatically be answered once you think about this issue that I'm about to tell you, all right? So, so and, I'm, and I, I'm gonna take a sort of reductionist view and you might say like, wow, that's a terrible way to look at this once I tell you what it is. And, and it's not, the, of course, it's not the only way we think about you. So I need all sorts of disclaimers here, but it is an important way to think about the whole situation, okay? So PhD programs in the United States are computer science, PhD programs are funded. Okay, what that means is you will get, um, there's, if you look at US universities, you look at the tuition rate uh, and it looks on the exorbitantly high number, you won't have to pay that, okay? You will in fact get a certain amount of money on which to live. So depending on the university, it could be anywhere from you know, 25,000 to $30,000 a year, okay? That's an amount of money that you will give that you will get, think of it as a salary or as a stipend, whatever word you want to use. So for example, when I went to PhD school, I did not need to spend a penny of my own money, okay? I got this amount of money every year. I didn't, I mean, back then it was much less, but it sort of tracks inflation. So I got a chunk of money every year from which I paid for my rent, I paid for my food. I had a little bit of money left over to buy a you know, CD once in a while back when we bought music that way, right? So you will be funded, right? Now, the exact mechanisms of funding depend on the institution, the person, the advisor, the time of year, et cetera. You will see words like RA and TA. RA means research assistant, TA means teaching assistant. Uh, the phrase RA is actually very confusing because assistant sounds like you sit there washing bottles or something like that. But research assistant actually means you are doing research. You're paid and the only thing you're doing at that time is doing research. Teaching assistant means you are helping somebody with a class. That's usually not a full-time job. It depends on how many hours at each university, but usually you'll have some time for research, but you'll also be spending some. So it, it is a way in which you get some amount of research done uh, while the money for you comes from the university, okay? So you'll see RA and TA and you'll see variations on these terms, but basically those are the two ways of funding. In general, uh, depending on the institution, much of your time will be spent as an RA. Certainly at places like Brown, most of your time is spent as an RA. At other institutions, it may be a little different. Now, why am I telling you this? Firstly, because I'm answering the question about funding, okay? You will be funded. You don't have to apply for funding. You don't have to apply for a scholarship or something like that. If you can get a scholarship of some sort, that's great, that can help, but you're not required to do anything. If you are admitted, okay, you're gonna be funded. And if you're not funded, Something is very weird and you need to find out what's going on because it is very unusual for a computer science PhD student in the United States to not be funded, okay? PhD programs, and, because just to compete, we can't compete if we don't fund because everybody else is funding, okay? So you're gonna be funded, okay? So what is the consequence of this? So one consequence is this is a pretty nice model, right? Like you get paid to learn, you get paid to do research and you just, you get paid to do this. You're not like paying out of pocket to do this, okay? But when you approach a faculty member, and you can approach in all sorts of ways, you could approach them in person, you could approach them through email, we'll get to all of that later. Or the other way, of course, you approach people is through a PhD application, all right? When you approach a faculty member, and this is a very cynical way of thinking about the world, and I apologize for that, okay? But what a professor sees is not just a human being, okay? What they also see is a giant price tag. You know how like sometimes you get these uh, ads where like, you know, bubbles are floating over people's heads. Think like that, right? There's this number floating over a person's head. And that number is roughly somewhere between 300,000 to $500,000 because that's what it costs to get a PhD student through a PhD program, okay? So, uh, you know, if much of that money comes from TA support, then maybe it's not on the professor's responsibility, but if it's RA support, the professor has to raise grants that brings in that amount of money. Now, you might say, wait, I'm not, I didn't hear, I thought you said 30,000 a year, so how does that translate? Not all of that money goes to you, some of it goes to travel, some of it goes to paying for other things, you know, keeping the lights on, paying for, you know, cl cloud computing, et cetera, et cetera. So not all of that money is coming to you. But the point is, from a professor's point of view, 
they have to somehow raise through grants typically, and we, don't, we, we won't get into details of that right now, uh, maybe not today, but they have to raise up to you know, anywhere from three to $500,000. Let me put $500,000 in slightly different words. That's called half a million dollars, right? So half a million dollars is an awful lot of money. So anytime any of these questions you ask yourself, you should ask yourself, how do I convince somebody that I'm worth a half million dollars? Now, you, most of you are, all of you probably are, right? You are, you're good, you're probably, you've done a bunch of stuff, you have a bunch of accomplishments, right? So it's not that you're not worth it. The problem is, A, so are other people, and B, you have to make the case that you are. The fact that you are, in some intrinsic sense, isn't clear, isn't enough the person has to see it. Does that make sense? I'd like you to like give me a reaction right now to, you know, like thumbs up or thumbs down that gives me, helps me understand if you understand the broader point I'm trying to make. Okay, I'm getting a lot of like, you know, pluses and thumbs ups and a little bit of like, oh yeah, well, sorry. Okay, but that's the reality. Okay, good. I, I don't see any thumbs down. So I think the point is being made so you can take your reaction off now, thank you. So. This is critical because everything else that we talk about essentially comes down to this question. Not everything, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I want you to have that perspective in your head because if you don't have that perspective in your head, all of these questions look somehow completely independent and disjoint and like, uh, you know, each question looks like a completely different question, okay? But if you have that perspective in your head, Oftentimes, you can generate the answer the question, to the question yourself. You don't need somebody to explain it to you. You can figure it out for yourself. Okay? So um, let me get to the next big thing that I like to talk to my students about. All right? Um, uh, those of you who have reactions, you can take them off now. Thank you. Um, here's a question that I did not see. Now, I know why I didn't see it. You're all filling out a form saying you're interested in applying for a PhD. So obviously, you're not going to have this question. But let me ask the question anyway. Should I even apply for a PhD? And let me, let me tell you why I'm asking this question. Um, and, and this is the same conversation I have with, uh, with Brown students and anywhere else I've done this kind of mentoring event before. Um, a PhD is, to, to many people, it feels like it's the natural next thing to do, okay? But it's not really the natural next thing to do there. For, it's not the natural next thing to do. There are lots of natural next things one can do, okay? So I'm, I'm gonna assume that most of the people here, I know some of you are not, but most of you here have some sort of significant computing background, okay? Which means there are other things you could be doing. For instance, you could go and work in industry for a while, okay? Now, there are some downsides to that. Uh, first, you may be not interested in that at all, but that doesn't mean that a PhD is where you should be going, okay? The fact that you're not interested in X doesn't mean, you know, there's sort of a, uh, it's not like excluded middle, right? That there are only two options, X and Y. If you're not interested in X, you must go to Y, okay? Secondly, you can learn a lot of skills in industry, okay? A lot of things, a lot of like discipline, the ability to get work done, to work with people, to work in teams, to build significant software systems, um, to get exposure to new technologies. If you went to a university that didn't do a very good job of exposing you to these things, you can pick up a lot of these things by working in industry, okay? You might have a much saner life uh, you know, uh, work-life balance. You might be able to clock out at five o'clock and go home. Now you can do that as a PhD student, but you know, sort of the research world is fundamentally open-ended, right? There's no product and date and delivery and shipment and client. It's just like, well, you got to think hard. You got to come up with ideas. You got to deliver. And so is everybody else doing it. It can feel like a lot of pressure, which you may not feel in industry. Okay. So what I tell my students is, think about going to industry for, you know, at least one or two years, all right? You'll also earn a lot more money. You can save some of that money. You can spend that money on other things that matter. You might have family members who need some financial support. If nothing else, if you're not spending it on anything else, you can start putting it away. And this is going to sound really weird to those of you who are like, you know, 21 years old. We're going to use the R word, retirement, right? And you think like, wait, retirement, I haven't even started. But you're all computer scientists, which means you understand exponential growth. 
And you know that the compound interest formula is also an exponential growth formula. So the same amount of money you start saving at 30 versus you start saving at 21, there's a giant difference in how the end point looks, right? Because of the way that formula works. So there are all kinds of good things you can imagine doing, going and working for some time before you apply for a PhD program. Of course, I would encourage you not to spend too long, you know, like taking courses, doing coursework and learning is actually a skill and that can atrophy a little bit. Plus, you, don't, you know, you may not want to graduate when you're too old, right? Like you want to start a family and, you know, settle down, et cetera. And you don't want to be, you know, you may not want to be too old when you start those things. Okay? But here's another reason I want you to think about this. Uh, let, me, let me draw a little picture for you. Okay, uh, here's the whiteboard. Okay, so this is a graph that my, well, I came to the US as a foreign student and my international student advisor drew this graph for me. Um, uh, her name is Ann Quillen. And basically this is the graph that Ann drew. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, here's my very good artwork on this graph. So this is time over here on this axis, okay? And this axis is basically, let's say your emotional state, E, okay? So you start off and you're like super excited. I'm in a new country, I'm in a new place and everything's like new and fascinating and I'm curious how this works. And you stay in that phase. And then after a while, you know, you get over that and you start to like, you know, you get into the swing of things and like the initial excitement wears off. And then after a while, it starts to go down and then you're like, oh no, I feel like homesick, I'm depressed, I miss my friends, I miss my food, my language, my family, et cetera. And you go through this and then, you know, you have to get past that and you'll get past that. And after a while, it will come back here. And, you know, it could end up in a whole bunch of ranges, right? You could end up here, you could end up here, you could end up here, right? There's a, there's a wide range of possibilities. But, but, you know, she pointed out every international student will go through this. And I, went, and I was like, nah, I don't think so. And sure enough, I went through exactly that. And I was like, oh, wait, I'm in that point of the graph now. Anne was totally right, okay? And this graph has stayed in my head for many years because for all these years, because I think something exactly the same happens with a PhD program, okay? You start off and you're in this euphoric state, right? I'm in this new place and new professors and look at all this cool gizmos and blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, stuff starts to get kind of normal and then stuff gets, and then things get hard, right? You finish taking courses, you start doing research and oh, research is going only so well. And then you're like, oh, you know, no, every paper I submit gets rejected. So nobody else seems to care. Then you get to the point of wondering like, does my advisor even care? And then you start to ask like, do I even care about the problem that I'm doing, right? And you need to know why you're in a PhD program because if you know why you're in a PhD program, that's how you get out of this trough. You're like, ah, I came here with a goal. I came here to accomplish something and I'm going to accomplish it and the whole world can be wrong. and I'm still right and I'm going to accomplish it. If you don't know why you came for a PhD program, boy, you're going to be so miserable, right? You will not, there will not be a positive trajectory here. There'll just be this and maybe you'll drop out. Um, there's like two terrible end, end goals, right? End cases, right? One is you don't drop out and you just like stick around forever and this like, you know, feeling miserable. The other is you do drop out. That's not actually a terrible thing. But if you drop out at the end of like, you know, four years or five years, you have no degree to show for it. You have nothing to show for it. And you've just like wasted all of this time and every, everybody is just sad, right? So this is why I tell students, it's good to know why you're applying for a PhD program, right? And one thing I suggest is, you know, if you can go to industry, and wait till you're actually angry about something. And now what I mean by angry is not angry like, you know, my boss is a moron, right? That's not a problem you're going to solve going to grad school because your advisor may also be somebody you don't, you know, you think is a, is a bozo. So that's not what I mean. I mean, like, look for something that is technically difficult, interesting, challenging. Find something where you say, wow, I, this is a problem. It's a real problem. I feel it in my bones. And I don't see anybody in industry really solving this. Because here's what that does. Now you can start reading the research literature, okay? You'll know what to search for. You'll search for it, you'll find it, and you can ask yourself, who's doing this? Who's thinking about this? Are they thinking about this the right way or the wrong way? Whose approach do I find most promising? Who's like, which, which perspective on this problem do I find interesting? And now you know exactly whom to apply to and where to apply, okay? This is a thing that you can accomplish uh, through some exposure 
outside university. You can get this through university. And, you know, there's a handful of students I look at and I say, like, you should just go for a PhD right away. It's clear that you're not going to enjoy industry at all, um, but you're also ready for a PhD. You're clearly thinking like a researcher, go straight for a PhD. But for many students, I think what I just said is actually much better advice. And in fact, um, many of my students do go to industry for a few years, like two, two to three years before they go on for a PhD. And I think it's actually much better for them. Okay. I, I, I have yet to get a student come back and tell me, I think that was terrible advice. And I wish I had gone straight to a PhD instead. Take that for what you will. Maybe they're not telling me because they don't want to hurt my feelings. I don't know, but my students are generally pretty honest and blunt with me, but I want you to think very seriously about this advice. Okay. And now many of you, of course, are already working in industry, so it doesn't really matter. But, you know, so, but for those of you who are not, um, that's, that's something to keep in mind. Okay. So um, uh, let, let me, so I've got several more questions before I get to anything in chat. So I'd suggest we hold that for a moment. Um, but let me talk about some other things. Masters versus PhD. In the United States, typically the masters is not a funded program. There might be exceptions. But even when there are exceptions, that might not be that they fund everybody. They might fund like, you know, 5% or something as an advertising way of getting people to apply, but they're not necessarily going to fund everybody. So be careful with that. And here's why the master's is not a funded program. It's not funded because, now, of course, there might also be exceptions, like there might be a diversity fellowship or something like that, but that won't, that won't apply to many of you, okay? So it's not funded because the master's is viewed as a professional degree. It's basically, you're picking up skills that will make you more attractive in industry. You're gonna go off and get a job and hopefully a higher paid job. So you're gonna pay for the degree and make up, the different, make up that money by working in industry. That's how the master's is viewed. Now you can get a master's through the uh, PhD program. Typically when you start the PhD, you do some amount of coursework and stuff like that at the beginning. And if you sign some paperwork, which I forgot to sign, you get a master's. I forgot to sign it, so I never got my master's, but you can get a master's sort of in progress. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a standalone master's, right? Where you apply to the master's program. Those things are different from PhD programs. Some of them may have research options, some of them may not. But the other thing is you're mostly taking courses as a master's student, right? So. The funding, I told you, you know, think about this $300,000 to $500,000 money, right? That's coming from places like the National Science Foundation for people to advance the state of science. You taking a bunch of courses is not advancing the state of science. So that's why you're not funded because you're doing something for your self-improvement, not to sort of improve society and improve the state of knowledge. Okay, does that make sense? Give me a quick reaction to make sure that everybody's on board with what I've said so far. Okay, good. Looks like everybody's on board. Thank you. Okay. Um, so similarly, I got questions like, does my publication record determine whether I'll be funded, et cetera? And um, no, it doesn't make a difference. You'll be funded the same amount pretty much. It might be a slight delta, but it's not going to make a difference. Okay. Now, next set of questions I got was along the lines of like, you know, how do I find professors? What are the best programs in X? What are the recurrent research topics in X and so on? Okay. Let me make a meta comment. You are asking to be a PhD student in computer science, okay? Which also means you're asking for somebody to raise like half a million dollars for you, okay? Or spend half a million, whether they raise it or not, that's what you're asking to be spent on you. You should have the ability to answer some of these questions for yourself. Like, what are the current research topics in X? When I was an undergraduate, there was basically no World Wide Web. There was no way for me to find out an answer to this question other than asking people, okay? Today, you are completely flipped around. What you have is an information overload, not an information underload. You can go look at the conferences in, the, in whatever subject, theoretical computer science, programming languages, whatever, look at the main conferences in those fields, read through. You may not have access to all of the papers. Now, of course, sometimes you can get the, the official papers are behind a paywall, but the papers that are interesting, you Google for them and you'll find them on the professor's homepage for free. So with a little extra work, you can find the papers, even if you don't have access to things like the ACM Digital Library, you might have it as a student member of the ACM or something like that. So that's something to consider, but you can find the papers. And even if you can't find the papers, you can see the titles and you can read the abstracts, okay? And you can find several of the papers online anyway. So there is not much of a reason for you to not be able to figure out 
what kinds of things are people studying in area X? You go to the main conferences in X, you look at what people are publishing. That's what research is being done in, okay? That's the kind of thing, that's the kind of initiative we would expect of a PhD student, okay? Like a student who's not willing to do that isn't gonna be a good use of that half million dollars, okay? Now, what are the best programs in X? Um, can I ask you to hold questions, please? Because I have several more things to go through here and I will take questions, but I'm gonna lose questions if I get them in chat right now, okay? So what are the best programs in X? I'm simply not gonna answer that question. And I'll tell you why I'm not gonna answer it. It's because I think the question, pay attention to this because it's really important. I think the question is meaningless. Here's why. You're thinking about this from sort of a ranking perspective and you want like a ranked list of something. The problem is just because something is highly ranked doesn't mean that it's actually a place you're gonna be enjoying, right? Every institution, every group, has its own unique perspective on how it thinks about problems. So for example, in programming languages, there are groups that think about things from a perspective of types. There are groups that think about things from perspective of concurrency. There are groups that think about things from perspective of control. There are groups that think about things from like a, de a denotational uh, semantics approach. Some who think of it from an operational semantics approach. Some of these are gonna really appeal to you. Some of these you're gonna hate, okay? You need to find the group that is doing things from a perspective that you enjoy. So it doesn't matter sort of how ranked they are. What matters is are they doing stuff that you enjoy and are they consistently publishing? So the way you find professors is look at conference proceedings. Look at the conference proceedings that are in areas that interest you. Read through at least the titles and the abstracts and where possible, read through the papers, okay? now you will probably struggle to read the papers, okay? You can still get through like page one, right? Past page one, it may be gobbledygook and you have no idea what they're saying, but you can get through page one. Read at least page one, okay? Try to get a sense, page through the rest of the paper and say, I don't understand what they're saying, but does this look like the kind of thing that I wish I could one day understand, okay? That's really the question you should ask yourself. The way I found my advisor is I one day I read this paper, like this, this, I, this astoundingly beautiful paper. I, I read it and, and I still remember it's like suddenly like, you know, the day was brighter and like sunlight was streaming through my window. It was probably a dark day or something, but it just felt like the whole world, you know, like, you know, the clouds had opened up and like, you know, I was just flooded with light and just wisdom and beauty, right? And I said, I wanna work with a person who can write a paper like this. I can't write it. I'm barely understanding it but this person is special if they can write a paper like this and I am super excited, right? And I still haven't written a paper as good as that, but I keep trying. In fact, a few years, two years ago, I gave like a, a talk about that paper at Papers We Love because that's how much I love this paper even today, okay? So that's how you find professors. Now you're saying, if you say like, I'm not sure what I'm interested in, well, then maybe you're not ready for a PhD program yet, right? Go back to step one. Remember what I just said? Wait till you find something that really motivates you. Maybe you work in industry, you get upset about something. You're like, man, like, why is it that like, it's so hard to do, you know, build systems? Why is it so hard to do distributed configuration? Why is it so hard to, you know, get cryptography to work and scale? Why is it so hard to, or it, it's, it annoys me that we don't have a solution to this. Or you might be like, wow, I've seen this. And this is beautiful. Like, this is a thing I really wish I understood, right? You don't have to be angry, right? But some base emotion, like it's either like deeply beautiful or deeply frustrating or makes you annoyed or something like that. When you find the area, you'll be able to find, you'll, you'll automatically gravitate. You're like, I want to know what else is out there. You'll start reading the proceedings. You'll start reading the papers. You'll get a sense of how to find professors that way. That is infinitely more useful to you than any ranking you can possibly use, okay? Now, you might be like, what if there's a professor out there who's not publishing? Well, if they're not publishing, may not be research active anymore, may not be a very good fit, okay? Because if you're trying to get a PhD and be successful, they're probably not a great way to be successful if they're not publishing anywhere, right? So, so don't look at rankings, look at papers. Papers are how people express what they're interested in, what they're excited about, okay? And keep in mind that every group has its own perspective. 
another area I work on is computing education research. I come at computing education research from a sort of formal programming languages perspective. There are other people who come at it from a sociological perspective. Other people who come at it from a cognitive psych perspective, which is something I'm trying to now adopt, okay? If you look at these like three different things, we look totally different. The papers we look, look totally different. And while we respect each other, we're not that interested in doing what the other person's doing, right? So you might think I'm really excited about CS Ed and you know, Brown's like a really you know, a highly regarded school, but if you're not interested in doing CS Ed from my perspective, I'm just a bad fit for you and vice versa for other faculty, okay? So exploit the fact that it's 2021, it's not 1921, it's not even 1981, not even 1991, it's 2021, everything's online. You can find this stuff, read the papers. So I'd like a little bit, um, I'd like a little bit uh, reaction to make sure that people are understanding what I'm talking about. Is this making sense? Don't waste your time on ranking sites. You're totally wasting your time and you're going about a very deeply personal process in completely the wrong way, okay? Finding an advisor is a deeply personal process. It's a person you're going to work with deeply, closely for like five to seven years. Okay. It's imagine like it's like going to, you know, I don't know, like a, a, a dating site and immediately, like, you know, the first person you get, like whatever, you, you do something, you swipe, and then you immediately marry that person for the rest of your life. That would be insane. Okay. It's kind of like that. Okay. So, so that, that's my advice on finding, finding faculty. Okay. Next. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some basic logistics. People asked about things like, what's the timeline for an application? Now, frankly, this is the kind of thing I think you should look up. But let me just say, roughly speaking, what's going to happen is you're going to apply around now. Okay, Deadlines tend to be in like November, December-ish area. So you need to get your application packet in now. You need to have figured out your reference letter writers well before now. One of the worst things you can do is put in all of this effort and money and whatnot into an application. And then we don't get letters from your letter writers. And well, then your folder is not going to get looked at. It's that simple. Okay. So if your folder is missing multiple letters, it's an incomplete folder. You're just not going to get consideration. Sorry. I mean, in a really, really, really exceptional situation, we might say, hey, you know, you, everything else about your folder looks great. We don't get your letters. But places that are competitive have enough applicants with strong applicants with full folders that incomplete folders, you're not going to get it. Okay. So you need to start early and figure out who your letter writers are going to be. So I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, let me, okay, so let me talk a little bit about the, the sort of how your folder is read, okay? So I got a whole bunch of questions like, does the GPA matter, is the GRE important? And these are all totally good, legitimate questions. Let me give you a sense of how we read folders, okay? First of all, if you ask is X important, what do you think the answer is? Yeah, it is. We wouldn't ask you for it if we didn't think it, was, it wasn't important. It's really that simple, right? We're not asking you for relevant information. GRE is a particularly interesting thing um, because as, as you may know, there's an increasing movement away from the GRE. Let me give you my personal take. This is strictly my personal opinion about the GRE. For, most pe for many people, the GRE is irrelevant. If you're coming here, here's, okay, let me, let, me, let me give you some perspective. Remember, Again, I'm gonna go back to the cynical model, right? The cynical model is the 300 to $500,000 model. So we need to know, based on the application materials that we have, are you a good admit or not, okay? And at a competitive place or a highly competitive place, the answer is sort of by default, maybe not unless you make your case for it, okay? So every piece of information that we get that helps us with that is useful, right? If you're from an institution we know about, now that includes lots of US institutions, but it can also include lots of institutions around the world, right? Many of us are from many countries. We have friends in many countries. Sometimes I will reach out to a colleague in another country and say, because we also have like large international networks, reach out to a colleague and say, I don't know much about this university. Can you tell me what your sense is about the place? Okay, so we have lots of ways of finding out. Um, but at the end of the day, if we're not sure about your institution, 
like you might have a perfect transcript from that institution, but if we're not sure how good the institution is, it helps to have some external calibration, right? And a GRE can serve as kind of a correlate there. If you did really well at your school, um, and by the way, I'm going to use the word school because Americans, uh, it's a little confusing if you're not from the US, but the word school in the US is used for all educational institutions, right? Grad school. Um, so school just means educational place, not, not, you know, not, not just for like little kids. So if we've heard of your school, that's great. If we haven't heard of your school, you have a great transcript, but you have a really crappy GRE. It's like, oh, what's going on? I don't know what's going on, but something looks a little off, okay? So I feel like the GRE is only useful for people who are coming from sort of, you know, less well-known institutions and therefore need to make a case that their folder should be taken more seriously, okay? Otherwise, I don't think the GRE has much value at all. It's a stupid exam, right? I mean, it's like vocabulary tests. Um, we know, I know personally, I've seen people from several countries who speak excellent English who just struggle because this is like a vocabulary test and not even a test of English, okay? So, so the GRE verbal is not very useful. I have to say, if you do poorly at the GRE quantitative, as a computer science student, that's kind of worrisome. I mean, a lot of this is like high school algebra, right? I mean, I expect you to be able to do pretty well at that. So the GRE can not help you very much. It can hurt you. I would say it's not very useful unless you really need to make a case for like, you know, trust my, trust my credentials. It gives one extra little data point, okay? I got questions along the lines of, should I focus on GPA or getting research experience? Both. I mean, here's the thing. We do accept students who have lower GPAs if they have something really exceptional with them, okay? But by and large, I think for a lot of us, we, we want, I mean, you're gonna get a PhD in computer science. I wanna know that you can do computer science, right? If you come in with like a low GPA and now I say, okay, I need you to go learn about X and do Y for the research and you can't learn X because it turns out you're not very good at learning different parts of computer science. That's a real headache, right? That's a real nuisance. So you are now ruling yourself out of doing certain kinds of research, right? That's a problem. And when you get a PhD, you might go on to become a faculty member. And as a faculty member, you might be expected to teach various courses. And if you can't like figure out basic computer science, that is a problem, okay? So the reason we care about the GRE is not so, sorry, the GPA is not that we have a cutoff or something, but it's like, we want low drama, right? I want you to struggle with the parts that are actually novel cutting edge research, not struggle with stuff that, you know, is actually taught in like a sophomore level, junior level course, but you didn't figure it out. And now you can't do like, I don't know, compute a shortest path algorithm because you never quite figured it out. Does that make sense? Do you see where I'm coming from here, right? Like what we, what, what, what we care about here, why we care about these things. Um, so do we, do we consider all these factors? Yes, and so you can overcome some of this, right? Like if you have a not fantastic GR, GPA, but maybe you took, you know, maybe your institution gave you a choice of courses and you took really ambitious courses. Well, that's great. That's what we like to see, right? So if you took really ambitious courses beyond your level and because of that, your grades were a little bit lower, that's fine, right? But if you took like conventional courses and your grades are not great, that's definitely troubling and problematic, okay? Um, is there any amount of research that can help overcome a low GR GPA? Well, you know, I don't know. It's hard, it's hard you might just not get into a top institution, a highly competitive institution because you know, of things like that, okay? I will get to research in a moment because I know like the single biggest misconceptions all have to do with research background. I will get to that in a moment, all right? But I wanna clear out the other stuff before that. Uh, I was asked, is there a formula that admissions committees use? No, there is not. How does industry experience translate is a very good question. And it translates indirectly. And what I mean is when we see folders for people with industry, it doesn't hurt, right? It means that you've got some, you've grown up a little bit, you have some maturity, you have some skills. That's all very good, okay? Um, it helps if you could have reflected on your industry experience in some way. As I said, like, you know, my, like, you know if you've gone out to industry and actually identified a problem, right? Like my, my favorite statements 
are statements from students who basically say, I went out, I did the following thing, whether it's an internship or like post-graduation industry or a project you were doing or whatever. I ran into this obstacle that I was frustrated by this thing. I then went up and looked up the research on this and I don't see solutions, but I see that you are working on something related to this. And this is what I understand of what you've done. And here's why I think it's not quite complete, but here's what I want, here's why I want to work with you, right? And if all of those things that you've said are accurate, I'm over the moon, right? Faculty love to see an applicant like that, right? Because this person knows why they're applying to me. They've done their background. They understand my work. They've understood and pointing out a weakness of my work is great, right? I, that's ultimately what you're going to do is you're going to take it to new places, right? But what does not work is when you try to bullshit your way around that, right? Like I read the following paper and it was great. Yeah, I know. I wrote it. I think it's pretty good. That's why I wrote it. I'm sorry. I'm kidding. But the point being, you don't need to tell us how great we are. Like we're a faculty. We only have big enough egos. Don't feed them. It's bad. Okay. What I want to see is substance. Okay. So let's talk about the statement of purpose next. Actually, so I've got some questions about letters. Let me talk about letters. Do the letters all need to come from professors? No. Okay. You can get letters from postdocs that you work with closely. You can get letters from industry. Now, um, in terms of industrial letters, let me share with you a link. Um, I wrote a, a little article on advice to letter writers. And this frankly is something you can see the link. I just put it in chat. Frankly, almost everybody would benefit from reading this in my opinion. Um, but uh, you might find it a little difficult to go to a professor and say, hey, here's how you read, uh, write a letter. But you can certainly share this with people in industry and you know, say like, here's some advice on how to write letters. And I attended this talk and this professor told, me, told us to share this around. Put the blame on me, right? You don't have to take any blame. Just say like, this guy told me to do it. I'm just passing it on because of him. So nobody gets upset at you. But I have a section in there specifically about industrial letters. Because the, here's the problem with industrial letters. Industrial letters tend to focus the wrong things. They're like, this person was a great team player. They've always showed up on time. They're very well dressed and we don't care about any of that. Okay, by and large, not completely, but by and large. What we care about is, can you do something useful as an academic, right? So it's fine for you to have industrial letters. And if you can't get any other kind of industrial letter, you get only that kind, one of those is fine. But at least one of your letters needs to attest to your ability to do like more advanced computer science, some kind of research. Sometimes a postdoc that you worked with closely may actually be a much better letter writer than any of your professors who didn't interact with you that closely. That's fine. But especially if you're working with a postdoc, give them a pointer to this letter, the, sorry, to my, to my article, so they know how to write a letter, okay? Getting good letters is important. And you know, people have asked, can, can letters attest to like knowledge and stuff if the GPA is low? Yes, to an extent, right? Now, sometimes, you know, maybe there's a really good reason you had an illness or something, something significant, or, you know, maybe you come from like, you know, extremely humble circumstances and you had to work a full-time job to support your family and you had only so much time. That's useful to know, okay? But there's only, at the end of the day, at a competitive place, there's only so much that you can make up for. Some amount you can make up, a whole lot maybe not, right? I hope that makes sense. So. I hope that I've said enough about letters. Let me know if there are any questions about letters right now. Type into chat. Okay, I'm not seeing any. Uh, I, I'll wait another moment just in case people are still typing. While I'm waiting, there's a question earlier. Is industrial R&D experience valued? Yes, absolutely. If you actually did something beyond just like, you know, showed up at work and built like a web front end database kind of thing, uh, I mean, depending on what you're trying to do research wise, uh, that can help industrial R&D can be valued, but then it's especially important that your industrial R&D letter writer be able to say something meaningful about the industrial R&D. And that's why this memo may be useful to them, right? So they can read on how they should describe the work that you did in the industrial R&D in a way that actually makes sense to us, okay? Um, and would narrowship at a university lab be taken more positively? Both the places result in academic publications. Let's get to publications in a moment, okay? I, I wanna hold that off for a moment because there's a, some really important things to say about publications. Okay, so uh, let me see. 
Our recommendations point is on pairing up of different letters. I don't quite understand what that means, but um, I mean, like, um, you want, you're going to have a spread, right? Like, I, so it's important at least one letter know you well and say something useful about you. We know that it's hard for you to get three letters that are all like, you know, extremely, you know, know you well, right? How many professors do you have time to make contact with? So it's fine for one or two of the letters. Now, this, this depends on institutions, right? If you're going to like a very, very top institution, that may not be enough, right? They like, uh, there's this phrase, DWIC letters. DWIC stands for did well in class, which are basically considered no ops, right? So no op letters are no ops. They don't tell you anything. Now, at highly competitive places, maybe you can't have any of those at a slightly less competitive, but still pretty competitive place. It's okay, as long as the other letters, one or two other letters actually say something in depth, okay? I mean, my own students, sometimes they've worked with me intimately for you know, multiple years. And so when they apply, they've got like two sort of performer letters, but they've got my letter that really lays out what they've done. That's what they need, right? Now, of course, they have the advantage of coming from Brown and getting a letter from me. So not everybody, I understand that's, that's sort of a very privileged position. But sometimes even one really strong letter can help as long as the letter is really good and the person knows what they're talking about. Do the credentials of the letter writers matter? Somewhat, yes. Look, again, goes back to the half million dollar model, right? I have to trust the folder that I'm reading. And I don't mean trust in the sense of lying, which is also a thing, but I have to trust in the sense that if there's a GPA in there, I have to trust that the GPA means something, that the classes were rigorous, right? That the, that, the, that the courses were actually tough enough that you actually learned something modern and you learned it well. If a letter writer says you're great at research and there's no evidence that they have done any research, what use is that letter to me, right? So a letter writer who can tell me either if they have credentials, that's an easy way for me to tell. Like when I write a letter, people know I've done research and I know what it means to do research. So if they've done something on their own, that's great. If they haven't, they need to give me reason to believe that they're good judges, right? We get an awful lot of letters that say like, this was a great student. He was one of the top students at our university. I strongly encourage you to admit him with a fellowship. It's like, okay, but why, right? So, so credi it's, it's, it's not so much about credentials, but credibility, okay? We need to know why we should believe the things that people are saying. And it's not that we think they're lying. It's that they may not be calibrated, right? They may not understand what it takes to succeed at our institution. And we need to know why they think they are right when they make the claim that you can succeed, right? Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm getting at here? Give me a quick reaction, please. It's a little subtle, right? It's not like a straightforward, there's no formula here, but it's like, that's the ultimate goal. We need to understand that you understand, okay? I, seem, I see that that point seems to be getting across. Uh, can we have letters from two advisors to work with on overlapping? Absolutely, it'd be similar in content, that's okay. It's better than getting like a DWIC letter, right? And maybe, maybe you tell them, I'm getting letters from both of you. Maybe you can focus on slightly different aspects, like which part, maybe you can talk to each other. I mean, I will often do this when, I, when, uh, when a student has worked with me and another colleague very closely. We will talk to each other and say, I'll deal with this part, you deal with that part. See if you can get them to do that. If not, maybe you have to be the one who helps coordinate that, but you can do that, okay? How do you calibrate letters if you don't know the letters? How do we calibrate letters, I assume is the question. Well, all kinds of things, right? It could be the institution they work at. Like we automatically know that some institutions are good. And so we know that their faculty are likely to be good. They might have a bio sketch. Occasionally, when I come down to like final evaluations, I might look up the professor and see whether they have a publication record, right? There are all kinds of ways we can do calibration without knowing them personally. Should the letter come from a prestigious professor? What do people think? Should it come from a prestigious professor? Thumbs up, thumbs down. So we have 10 votes, nine or 10 votes in favor, two votes down and one vote like, um, I don't know. Um, there's only one correct answer here, by the way, which is the I don't know. Rest of you are wrong because you didn't ask the critical question, does the professor know me well enough to actually write a useful letter, okay? If you get a very, very well-known professor who writes basically a one paragraph letter saying, um, the student asked me to write a letter, they seem to be quite good. 
Um, and that's it. That doesn't give me enough information. Okay, that stuff is completely useless. You need letters from people who know. It's look. It's it's a it's a cross product, right? The quality of the professor times the quality of their interaction with you. You can have a you a professor whose like word is not worth anything, who's you know done a lot of work with you, but if they can't express it, that product ends up as being zero. You can have an incredibly prestigious professor, but if they can't say anything of substance about you, that product is also a zero. You want to maximize the product. Okay. Uh, do I need a letter from college professors or academic professors are fine. I don't understand the distinction, but I think the answer is yes. Does being a TA in rigorous undergrad courses add? Um, I don't know what a top 10 university is, so I'm going to ignore that part. Does being a TA in rigorous courses help? Yes, a little bit. Okay. Especially if a professor can say something meaningful about your TAing experience, but also ideally connected to why your, uh, you know, what, why that makes you better. Right? Like as a TA, you were able to answer questions authoritatively, which demonstrates a really good understanding of a subject. That's useful. Okay, You were a really patient TA who held lots of hours. Eh, that's nice, but we're not bringing you here to TA. Right? It could be useful around the periphery, but that's not the main thing that's going to help you get in. Um, if you're waiting for the official master's unofficial version work, yes. Most places will take an unofficial version as long as they eventually get an official version. But I, I swear, do not mess around with that, okay? Don't even think about messing around with that. Because if you mess around and you cheat in any way, you will not only lose your admission, you can lose your admission at any time. So let's say you decide, oh, I'm gonna submit an unofficial uh, uh, transcript and I'm gonna doctor my rec records a little bit because it's just a PDF, I can edit the PDF. And later on, we find out even three years in, you will be kicked out and all of your degrees will be rescinded and you'll have nothing to show for it, all right? So don't mess around with that. Unofficial is fine, just don't try to play any clever tricks. It's strictly necessary for all the fields to be in a similar field to our prospective advisor, no. We expect as an undergrad that you've had very broad range of experience so it wouldn't even make sense, okay? So we, you know, it's unlikely you took like three courses in the same subject as an undergrad. You might have taken one course in the subject. So that's not at all an expectation. Okay, let me move on to talking about the statement of purpose. Okay, so I've sort of hinted at the statement of purpose already. Let me tell you about like some anti-patterns in the statement of purpose. Here is my favorite anti-pattern. I've never talked about this publicly before, but I think it's really important that I, I say it publicly because it's, 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 it's extremely it's extremely common and extremely frustrating to get, okay? So let's start with how you should write your letter, okay? So, so typical statement of purpose starts off by saying, you know, like a common thing that people will say is, you know, I've got my first computer when I was like five years old and, uh, you know, I built my first program when I was seven and things like that, right? And it's a pretty standard way to start a uh, statement of purpose, right? You've all probably seen statements of purposes that say something like this. All that makes sense? Like that's a good way to start, right? You know, just give me a quick reaction, make sure we're on the same page. Okay, so I'm glad to see there's a variety of reactions, but those of you who have a thumbs up are completely on the wrong page here. I really don't care what you did when you were five years old, okay? In fact, if you're gonna tell me that you did something when you were five, if you had a computer when you were five and I certainly didn't have a computer when you were five, I wanna know you had a head start on me by about 10 years. So what did you accomplish with that head start is the only question that I'm interested in at that point, right? Like you had one starting at five and this is all you've accomplished. Doesn't sound very impressive to me actually, right? We don't care about what you did when you were five years old. We don't care about like your parents being wonderful people and all that, that's all great. What we care about is remember, it's a statement of purpose, purpose, not a bio autobiography. When you're famous, you win a Turing Award, then everybody wants to read your autobiography. Then you can tell us how you got a computer when you were five years old. We are interested in why should I look at you as a PhD student? Keep in mind, faculty are busy. We get lots and lots of applications. We have to read lots and lots of folders. If you spend the first paragraph of your application telling me about the computer you had at five, you've lost my attention already, okay? I'm, I'm putting it in like really brutal terms because I need people to understand this. Get to the point. What are you applying for? Why are you applying? What do you know? 
That's what I want to know. Okay. I told you already what my dream statement of purpose looks like. Not everybody is going to have the dream statement of purpose, but the anti-pattern of starting off and treating this as like your rambling autobiographical space, you have already sunk your application at that point, most probably. It takes a lot of effort to get past all that and get to page two where the interesting stuff is. When you are talking about research that interests you, again, being superficial is a kiss of death. As I said, this pattern where people will say, here are the three papers of yours that are really interesting. And all they do is list the title. And they say they were really interesting and really impressive. It's like, what I read from that is you didn't actually read the papers or you didn't understand them. Like you've just demonstrated to me you didn't read the papers or you didn't understand them, which makes me extremely uninterested in reading, in like looking at you as a candidate. Okay. We want to see substance. We want to see depth. Now, your personal biography is important in as much as it is relevant. Okay. So if there's something truly interesting about you, I'm interested in hearing that. Okay. Sometimes it might be like, by the way, I, you know, I happen to also be like the world champion at building, you know, Lego base, such and such is. Okay. Or I happen to have this other interest in something or whatever that could be relevant. You might have a personal life story that is particularly important. Okay. So for example, maybe you are blind. Okay. Computer science is incredibly hard for people who are blind. Just think about it. It's like, like how visual our media are. Right. And like most programming languages, IDEs don't even work for blind people. So if you're blind, like that's really important for us to know because like suddenly the fact that you have, you know, a slightly lower GPA is like, holy cow, that's impressive that you got that far. Okay. So if there's something important, say it quickly. If it's important, if it's relevant, if it gives us some extra sense about you, helps us interpret say it quickly. Don't dwell on it for a whole page unless you really have a page to fill up. Say it in one to two paragraphs. If you had a debilitating illness, we don't need to know the details, but if you were ill for a semester and so you have one semester where your GPA, where your, your courses look like crap, okay? You can say it. It helps if there's a letter writer who can correlate that, right? So you can use the statement of purpose, the personal statement to make like small things like that, little biographical things, okay? But by and large, focus on why you are worth half a million dollars. What are you interested in? What are you passionate about? Why are you passionate about it? What do you know about it? I want to know, like, do you even know enough to be passionate about this question? Okay. Those are the things that you need to focus on the statement of purpose and make it genuine. Simply listing like the names of a bunch of faculty is not impressive. We know our names. We don't need you to tell us our names. Okay, we want to know what have you actually invested real time in, right? And you might say, well, there's so many universities, like how can I invest time in all of them? I hear you, I understand, but remember what you're asking for in return, right? You're asking for a half million dollars. And if you're not willing to put some time and commitment into it, why do you want somebody to then spend that money on you? Okay. At this point, I'm going to pause and take questions about the statement of purpose. And if you could remove your reactions, that'd be really great. In the SLP, should I go into details about research I've done? No, you should tell us about your research. If you have done research, tell us about it. Okay. Don't ramble, but tell us about it in enough detail that we can judge you. Right. So if you've done something good, you've done something interesting, you should tell us. It helps us understand that you're capable of doing things and you're capable of explaining what you've done. Sometimes, you know, Here's something important. When we read about the research here in the statement of purpose, we're also reading about the research from the professor or professors who advised it. I'm very interested to hear how these match up. Okay? Sometimes in the statement of purpose, the student will look like they had the idea and they did everything and they, they were like in charge of the whole thing. And then the, the professors later, like the student came on and helped my PhD student do their work. Okay? Now, I don't know which one is the truth, but it doesn't help if there's the mismatch. Right? I need to see that you're well calibrated. And I would like to make sure that they're both saying roughly similar things. So describe yourself honestly. If you describe yourself dishonestly, I'm going to find out from the letter and that will be really bad. Okay. Hope that makes sense. Okay. Um, how do you talk about research interests of professor? Um, well, you don't need to tell me my research interests. I know my research interests. I want to know your research of interest. It's your statement, not mine. Right? So what I want to know is how do you connect to me? 
So for example, I had a PhD student who I uh, not only admitted, but really, really wanted to attract, right? To Brown last year, uh, who I'm very happy to say came here, um, who was interested in uh, computing education and in program synthesis, okay? Well, and what he did was he described his interest in the work he's done in program synthesis. And he talked about why he connects it to computing education. And I read this and I said, yes, this person understands program synthesis, understands computing education, understands the connection between the two, okay? So this is like what I would call, you know, the, to use a phrase in America, shovel ready, right? It's ready to go, right? I don't need to spend all this time teaching this person. They understand what they're doing. We got off, we actually started collaborating even before they gra finished graduation, right? So, so you don't need to tell me about my research, but I want you to tell me how you think you connect to me and to tell me how you connect to me, you have to have understood my stuff well enough. I do, I will often see letter statements where a student will say, because professor is interested in such and such, I'm like, I am? That's news to me, right? A common thing that I see is, um, you know, you go to the faculty listings and they'll list like areas or something like that. So if you go to the Brown CS department, you see a list of areas and you'll see like, you know, I'm listed under the security and cryptography group because I used to do a bunch of security research. I have not done anything in cryptography to 2008. And even that was really like formal methods for cryptography rather than cryptography. So when somebody applies and says, I'm really interested in Professor Krishnamurthy because of his interest in cryptography, like you have not spent like a minute looking at my webpage, have you, right? That's like a kiss of death right there. Now, maybe somebody else will admit to you, but I sure as heck like, I don't want to have to include your folder. Does that make sense? People understand what I'm getting at so far? Give me a quick reaction. Okay, good. Looks like we're going doing well. Good. Okay, so um, my interests are relevant to my major, but I've done a lot. My interest wrote a paper. Okay, good. So um, wait, I wrote a paper and gave it published myself without advisor relevant courses. Is that legit? Is there research in a different niche from intended field of study within subfield harmful? Let me answer the second question first. So is research in a different area from what you intend to study harmful? No, absolutely not. We don't even know what you're gonna do when you get here. You may come here to do security, you may end up in programming languages. You may come to do programming languages, you may end up in theory. You may come to theory, you may end up in human factors, okay? Does it help if you've done research? Same area, it doesn't hurt, that certainly does help. But if you have actually successfully done research in some area, okay? That tells me that you have some of the basic skills that we care about. That's what we care about. We do not expect you to come in like already fully formed. It's our job to fully form you, not to expect you to come in fully formed. Now, I will say this may be a bit of a difference between the very top tier and the tier below, okay? So at the very top tier, I still think there is a fair bit of flexibility, but there is a stronger expectation of like, you know, the, the, the quality of research, the depth of research and so on is typically stronger um, than a tier below. We admit students who have not done research, okay? But they have to have something else really going for them. They have to probably have an exceptional record. They probably have letters. They probably went to a university that didn't do research, right? If you go to a non-research university, it's not fair to expect you to have done a whole lot of research. But, you know, in the US, you can do things like go to, to do like things called REUs, like summer REUs. You may not have that option in your country. Then, unfortunately, we're going to have to look at other credentials like which institution did you go to and who do you get your letters from to confirm that we can trust you. And, you know, for example, we have universities where we steadily get students from because we know the people there, we know the faculty there. And even though they may or may not do research with undergrads, we know that we can trust those people. If we can't trust, that's going to be hard, right? You might have to go to a slightly a uh, less competitive place and maybe work your way up rather than go to a highly competitive place right off the bat. But any evidence to have done research is generally great, okay? It's all good. And you can emphasize that. You can say in your statement, I did research on the following thing, even though this is not the main area of my study, this is what I got an opportunity to do as an undergraduate. Now, here's what I'm interested in for grad school. And you might have an interesting story to tell about why you changed, 
right? You might be, I thought programming languages is really interesting and that's what I did in undergrad research in. But then as I thought about it, I realized like languages are ultimately human facing things and PL researchers don't study that enough. And so now what I wanna do is I wanna study the human factors of languages, which is really more of an HCI question. That's a great story to tell, right? And that shows me that you have like a vibrant mind. Your brain is active and you're actively thinking about the world. You're not just doing things that are given to you. You're actually reflecting and thinking, thinking fresh thoughts. Okay. Let me address the really, really big question about publications. Um, at the most competitive places, most students have publications coming in. But even there, so we will certainly admit students who don't have publications. Several of our students don't have publications. You might have done really good research without a paper, okay? You could have done like a good honors thesis at a place and you might not have a paper to show for it, but as long as the letter writer can say, this person did really good research and uh, you know maybe it's gonna be published late next year, maybe it won't be published, that's okay. If the letter writer is credible and they can say that you've done good research, that's what, that is still just as good or better than a paper. What I really wanna combat, like the single most important message I wanna to convey today is having a publication list is almost irrelevant. In fact, it can hurt you. Did you hear me say that? It can hurt you? Everyone, did you hear me say that having a publication list can hurt you? Can you confirm that you heard that? Okay, what do I mean by this? There are a lot of what are called predatory publishers. Predatory means they will publish anything typically for some payment. Those papers are worse than no papers at all because what it suggests is that you actually have very poor judgment and don't understand the process. It's a difference in syntax and semantics. You understand the syntax, which is a thing that looks like a publication. You don't understand the semantics, which is an actual contribution to human knowledge, okay? Sometimes people attach those papers. Whenever I've looked at these, they're garbage. They're not really research papers, okay? They were lightly reviewed, not reviewed at all. Basically, you paid somebody to publish and they published and that was it. And there are some countries where this problem is particularly rampant. India is one of them. This is a rampant problem, but there's tons of scientific publication venues, none of which are worth anything. Now, if your advisor chooses to publish there, there's not much say you have in the matter. And hopefully in the letter, it'll come across and you know you, that, that's not your problem. But especially if you are trying to publish there, like, look, we know what the good venues are. We know because we routinely publish in them, we chair in them, we review for them. We know how the publication process works, okay? So if you have a paper at some conference we have never heard of, if you publish in my area, in a conference I have never heard of, what does that say about the quality of the venue, right? So I would say, stop this mad pursuit of publication. This is the single most pernicious problem we have in computing, uh, computer science right now with PhD applications, where everybody tells everybody else, you can't get in without papers, okay? And so then everybody else rushes off to find a way to publish a paper. And at that point, like you've all misinformed each other. Literally, the reason I'm running this session is to tell you, don't get into this trap, okay? If you have no papers, that's okay, as long as somebody can meaningfully talk about your ability to do research. Having formal publications is neither necessary nor sufficient, okay? Even if you have a paper at a good conference, what I care about is, what was your role in the publication? Right? If what you did was in fact be the bottle washer and the professor said, ah, you know, the guy stuck around for a few months, let's put his name on the paper, that doesn't actually tell me very much. I need the professor to say, she actually worked at it and she was a major, she was a significant contributor. Despite being an undergrad, she was able to perform and keep her own against the you know, fellow PhDs, you know, against the graduate students she was working with. That's fantastic. I love, we love to see those letters, right? So, that we've had cases where we reject people with publications. We reject people with papers all the time. Sometimes we reject them because they're predatory papers. Sometimes we reject them because they're, you know, the student was on a major paper, but it was not a contribution that seemed significant. Sometimes 
we just have too many applicants and you know this person's paper was not that interesting to us even though it was at like an elite conference all of those things can happen it is neither necessary nor sufficient okay neither necessary not sufficient please don't waste your money there's a comment here in the in the in the discussion in the chat if they email and ask you for publication they are predatory that is a fantastic rule of thumb i could not have put it better it's a phenomenal rule of thumb okay if their reviews come back within a week it's predatory if the reviews are short they're predatory if the reviews are not detailed and don't give you feedback if they don't reject papers they're predatory okay Six serious conferences are basically there it's like very competitive process very detailed thoughtful reviews strong technical evaluation anything short of that is not i'm going to make a controversial statement now acm generally does not do predatory stuff i do not i cannot say the same thing with confidence about ieee ieee feels like to me it feels like there's a controversial statement it feels to me like ieee has decided to use its brand to create a whole bunch of venues many of which to me are fairly questionable so to me an ieee publication doesn't mean as much anymore it used to it doesn't acm still means something i'm dubious about ieee i could be wrong okay so ieee don't come and sue me give me evidence that i'm wrong instead all right but uh, i'm i'm dubious about ieee it's look the question is not who's the publisher question is what is the process is there a serious pc are they asking you for serious papers how long are they taking to review how long, how detailed is the review if any of these things fails it's not a serious paper and we don't care right you're almost better off not telling us about it than telling us about it okay um how much do blog posts help with specific research uh how much do blog posts about the specific i assume what you mean is blog posts that you wrote that could be pretty interesting right like if somebody gives me uh uh says they have a blog post about something i will read i will often if the if the person candidate makes it to my, sort of my finalist list i will read it but it better be good right uh because it hasn't had the benefit of peer review and everything else but sometimes i find candidates who have done like really interesting blog posts and demonstrate that they have like depth and skill and knowledge and that's really good that's great um now the question does it add value if we're a peer reviewer at a known conference in the very 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 unlikely event that you are a peer reviewer at a major conference that would be fantastic and you will know how to tell us about it um if you're a peer reviewer if you if all you did was review for somebody that's less significant but then get the person you reviewed for to say how good a job you did right because one of the ways you demonstrate your ability to read and understand research papers is by providing good evaluations so if somebody you know your advisor gave you a letter to paper to review and you wrote a good useful review get them to say that in their letter because that's a very useful thing for the for us to know about um one of the things that i do and i'm not sure everyone will necessarily agree with this is um i here i'm going to paste a link in here of uh, um uh, this is the this is the document that i give to my students asking me for a recommendation letter for them so these are typically students who worked with me some taken courses from me done research with me and so on one of the things you'll see in there is i ask for something called a brag sheet okay now and it it takes some effort to write that but um you might ask your uh advisor you know like again it's a little delicate telling them how to run their their lives but you can say hey there's this guy who gives us lots gives out lots of advice and he made a claim that a the, uh, that he asks the students for a brag sheet this is what he calls a brag sheet this is what he says do you mind if i give you one okay and your advisor might say yeah sure you can give me one that's okay doesn't hurt and then you can give them one and that's a place where you can remind them of things that you've done okay and it's basically it helps them structure their their letter and reminds them of things that they should have talked about but may not have thought think thought to write about so the fact that you did some reviewing like that might be a thing you might want to remind them and they could say oh he did a really good job reviewing or she did you know uh she was excellent she gave me like all this detailed feedback etc cetera, etc cetera. okay or you know they might say they didn't do that great a job but you know they did a job that was comparable to their level as an undergrad right depends 
Um, how much weight do workshop presentations at high-level conferences compare? Uh, it really depends on the workshop. It depends on like, is it a new workshop and stuff like that. Um, it, it's a little hard to tell. Sometimes a conference, a second tier conference is better than a, for a workshop associated with a first year conference. Sometimes it's not, it depends on the quality of the work, right? Again, you're again looking for like a ranking and there isn't a ranking, okay? What matters is the quality of the work. Like if you've got a paper, send the paper along. Tell us what you did on the paper. I wanna read the paper. I don't care where you published it. What I care about is what is the quality of work that you did, right? So like you have to get past the initial threshold, but when you get to like being one of the final people, we are gonna spend a lot of time on you before we make a decision, okay? But uh, you don't have to worry too much about this. There's another question about this single author paper at a core A conference compensate. Yeah, that sounds pretty good if you have a core A conference. But again, you're asking about core A, core A starts. Like, I'm not gonna answer that question. I think these, these rankings are all silly. I think the whole core thing is kind of ludicrous anyway. Uh, there's a huge controversy about exactly what counts as core A and core A star and whatnot. So it's irrelevant. I, I just think not, none of these things matter. Um, does volunteering at conferences? No, not really. I don't see how it helps us. Um, it tells us you volunteered at a conference. That's all it tells us, okay? Okay, so are there any other questions about the statement of purpose or of the application uh, process or about recommendation letters? Ah, one thing I didn't answer, which is relevant to the question I just got, what if your undergrad was in a different area? Okay, this is important. Let me ask you, think about this again through the lens of the half million dollars, okay? You're asking to get a PhD in computer science. If your undergrad is not in computer science, what do you think I care about? Can you do basic computer science, okay? You're gonna have some coursework requirements. Do I have reason to believe that you'll get through the coursework, that you'll be able to do some amount of theory of computation, some amount of software engineering, some amount of this, some amount of that? right? If I have no evidence for that, that's problematic. That's going to make me a little more conservative, okay? But if I have evidence for that, that might be great. Like, it's very common that in, like, graphics programs, they love physics students who can also do some computer science because graphics has so much physics in it, the physics students may know more about computer graphics than most computer science students do, right? In a machine learning program, you might care more about a statistics student than a computer science student because the stats background may be more important, okay? So if you're applying for a specialized program, find out what their requirements are. But if you're applying for a CS PhD, we still want some evidence that you can do basic computer science, right? You might be a music major and that's perfectly okay, right? As long, you might bring something to bear that most computer science students can't bring. What I care about is, is this gonna turn into like a big drama? right? Where well, you can't pass any courses, you can't do any of the basic stuff, and you only want to do your very specialized thing, that's not going to be a successful PhD experience. So how can you demonstrate these other things? One way you can demonstrate it is by actually building things and showing, sending us a link to your GitHub repo or something like that. Another way you can do it is to so do courses on something like Coursera, okay? Those aren't going to be like official credits for it, but it's a way of saying if you approach us with this attitude of how do I prove myself to you, right? You can say in your statement, even though my bachelor's degree is not in computer science, here are the reasons I feel I'm confident about being able to do computer science work, X, Y, and Z. I built systems, I've done the following, I've worked on a research project, or even I'm now, uh, you know, I'm, um, uh, I've taken the following Coursera courses and done really well at them, right? Those are all evidence that A, tells me you're conscious of the problem, and B, you've tried to find solutions to that problem. That kind of student is fantastic, okay? Especially if you're applying in a way where your expertise is actually of relevance. Like, as I said, for example, a physics student who's applying in graphics, a statistics student applying in machine learning, a psychology student applying in human, human computer interaction, et cetera, et cetera, those students can actually be more attractive than a straight up CS student. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, how important is things like outreach detail? Eh, mildly, um, you know, 
Should we swap it to relevant research experience? Or what do you think? Based on what I've said so far, I'm going to let you figure out the answer to that question yourself. Uh, can I write my major or math GP on the statement of purpose? They're far better. Look, you're not going to hoodwink us because at the end of the day, you're going to have to give us all of those GPAs on your application form. And we're going to see all of those. So, um, you know, that's, that's not a thing you can hide. And if you don't include something, we're going to get suspicious. Now, that said, what we care about primarily is your GPA on relevant courses, okay? So if you took a music course and did really badly on that and it doesn't have any impact on what you're trying to do for a PhD, I don't care, right? You went off and studied, I don't know, like philosophy, humanities, whatnot. That's actually great. And you maybe you didn't get great, core, great uh, scores on those, doesn't really matter, right? But now if you took those courses, you took philosophy courses and what you're applying is to do like ethical AI, well, that would be a real problem. Right? So what we care about is how did you do on relevant courses? Because sometimes I also see the opposite phenomenon. Student has a really good overall GPA, but their GPA in like computer science and maybe math is lower. Right? And when I look and they're applying in say programming languages, they got a B in programming languages. It's like, um, what are you doing here exactly? Right? So what we care about is relevant courses. If you've done well on relevant courses, that's great. If you don't, you better have a good explanation for it. Um, Irrelevant courses are basically irrelevant. So low overall GPA doesn't necessarily matter as long as you did well on relevant stuff, okay? Um, so I did get a question earlier and I got to get in chat about a second PhD. That's perfectly fine. Um, American universities, I've gotten questions like this about second PhD being an older PhD student. Um, usually fine, right? Some institutions may have a rule against it. Uh, but by and large, that's perfectly fine. I know our department has had people who've gotten a second PhD. I know multiple people who've had second PhDs. It's uh, bizarre to get a second PhD in the same subject, unless maybe you got your first PhD in another country where they didn't have a significant PhD program or something, then you'd have to make a case for that. But uh, we, I know people uh, who've gotten second PhDs. That's perfectly fine. Okay. Um, second PhDs are okay. Older students are fine. Uh, in fact, legally in the US, we cannot discriminate against age. So uh, we often don't even know your age. I mean, we can kind of guess the age depending on when you got your bachelor's degree, uh, but we don't really care that much. We care about the applicant. Um, and now if you're an older person and there's some good reason why you're applying, it probably helps to say like, I don't know if you're 65 and you are like, I've retired now, I want to do it. That might be a little weird because it's like, well, you're not gonna actually have a productive research career necessarily after this, unless you have a good reason to, but it might be, you know, I just sold my biotech company and I'm finally retired and now I wanna get a PhD and I can, you know, do cool stuff. It's like, yeah, that tells me fantastic, right? Depends a little bit on the story that you're trying to tell there. Um, undergrad and other discipline, high scoring masters, seems fine. Again, I expect you to be able to apply the general advice I've given you at this point to all of these situations. Are there stylistic preferences adhere to formatting an organization? Well, paragraphs are really good. They seem to be a little out of fashion these days. Um, break it down into a logical organization. If you can add some subheadings to like break it down to make clear the different parts, never hurts, generally helps. Like one of the ways, one of the things we're doing is judging, can you do basic writing? Not can you do scientific writing? That's the thing we're gonna teach you, but can you do basic writing? And if you produce like a one page, paragraph that's like the whole page is one big paragraph with no clear organization that sounds pretty bad like you clearly don't like what that message that sends anytime you write a wall of text is it says i don't care about your time i couldn't care less to organize my thoughts you go figure it out well that's not going to work so well in an admissions office it's not even going to work well in email okay i like i take the time even when i'm writing to students i take the time to rewrite my message, break it down to paragraphs, make it make logical sense when I'm writing to them. So the least I expect from them is the same in return. Okay. Um, are interviews ever apart? Typically not, but if there is an interview, there's a question of how should I prepare for one? Some places might do an interview, right? If somebody contacts you not having admitted you, that's a kind of an interview, okay? They're asking you some questions. They're trying to find out more about you. Is it an interview interview? Maybe not, but they're trying to learn about you and they haven't yet admitted you. Do you think they're going to use the information to make their admissions decision? Yes. Isn't that what an interview is? So effectively, yes. Okay. 
And I, I often, I'll be honest, I often contact admitted, uh, pre-admitted students. I'll say, look, I looked at your folder. I'm interested. I want to talk more. It doesn't mean I've made a decision to admit you. It means I have some more questions. That's where I might ask questions along the lines of what we talked about. Like, what did you do on this research project? I see you had this paper. Why did you publish it there? Or what did you do on this project? What was your contribution? Can you point me? Like, what skills did you develop? Those are the kinds of questions I would ask. ask okay. How do you prepare for this? I don't think you can prepare for this, right? Um, you either know your stuff or you don't. Uh, you're not going to be able to talk your way out of it, right? Because it's going to be, if it's a live conversation, the, you know, the professor is going to know how to lead the conversation to the point where they find out what you know and what you don't know. So I would say maybe like reread your statement is the one prep advice I would give, right? Because somebody says, well, you said in your statement such and such, and like, oh, I did. That's pretty bad. Okay. So reread your statement, make sure you know what you said, um, be prepared to answer questions about it. I guess that's what I would say in terms of uh, preparation. Um, low grades due to purely curated courses. I don't know, just say it up straight. Um, we understand that sometimes, you know, for example, maybe you had a political uprising in your country or professors walked out or something like that. That's useful to know, that gives us some context. Uh, but beyond that, if you're just like complaining about your university, I don't know that'll, that'll get very far. Um, how do you explain being from a lesser art institute? I don't think you can say much about that, but if you have things you can say about the credentials of your institution, keep it short, but it's worth saying, right? If you think we may not have heard of your university and there's something you can say that's reasonably objective about it, um, doesn't hurt to say it, but keep it short, okay? Um, does it hurt our case for a professional master if you have a research background? No, not in the slightest. Research never hurts, may or may not help you, but um, it's not gonna hurt you, okay? Okay, some of the other questions that I got were things like, I got questions along the lines of like, you know, uh, <clears throat> when a process, what's the process once I started a place? Do they have a rotation program? Do I get assigned to an advisor at the start? Uh, what does a day in a PhD student's life look like? It's a very easy answer to all of these questions. First of all, they're not relevant until you get admitted. When you get admitted, every US program in computer science, every PhD program has a visit event. They are, especially now, we're all very attuned to doing them virtually. So no matter where you are in the world, you'll be able to at least virtually visit. They will put together a program. There'll be talks by the faculty. There'll be talks by the graduate students. There'll be panels. There'll be you know, diversity events, et cetera, et cetera. You will learn everything you want to learn about the department. There'll be plenty of options, opportunities to ask questions. One of the things about the US is there are no centralized rules, okay? This is not true of other countries, so it can be a little confusing. Every university gets to make up its own rules, its own requirements. Every department in every university makes up its own requirements. So what I say of Brown won't even apply to like, you know, Harvard, which is 40 miles north, or Yale, which is like, you know, 60 miles south, okay? So every place makes up its own rules. When you're admitted, they'll answer all the questions you wanna know. They'll tell you half these things and they'll answer all of your questions. If you haven't been admitted, we don't really care. What's the, what's the point? Okay. So once you've been admitted, you'll get plenty of opportunity to ask all of these questions. Okay. Some of the other questions I got, should I work with a junior faculty member or a senior faculty member? That's actually a kind of fun question. <clears throat> okay. Junior faculty, obviously a little less established. As a general rule, junior faculty are hungry, right? They're eager to make their career. They're more likely maybe to spend long hours and like work with you and like try to get you along. Flip side of it is they might be a little more anxious. They're still learning the ropes. Senior faculty obviously have the advantage of experience. Uh, they know maybe much more. They have a bigger over overview of the whole subject. The flip side of it is they may be less research active. So I would say, look at the research activity of a person before worrying about whether they're junior, senior, whether they're like, you know, uh, prestigious or not prestigious or whatever. Are they current in their research? Are they current in something you care about? Things they cared about 10 years ago, they probably don't care about any longer, right? Are they current in the field that you care about? Are they actively doing research in it? That's what matters, right? Once you are admitted, you'll have a chance to talk to them, okay? It is perfectly fine to ask them questions, okay? In the American system, it's perfectly okay to ask people questions. You don't have to be afraid of asking people questions. Questions are welcome, okay? What is your advising style? What do you expect of students? What are your work hours? What do you expect students' work hours to be? What is the day in a PhD student's life? You know how you get the answer to that question? 
ask that advisor's students. Ask them without the advisor present. If the advisor is not willing to make time for you to talk to students without them present, that is a bad sign, okay? I always let my, pre my applicants, I, we sometimes have a group meeting and I'll say, I am now getting the hell out of here so you can talk to the students and you can find out if I've been lying to you, they will tell you that you can find out without me present and it's not being recorded, talk away, okay? You should be given that opportunity. Talk to their graduated students, recently graduated students, find out from them. If they're not willing to introduce you to people, that's a problem. If they're new, of course, they can't introduce you to anyone. Then you talk to them one-on-one -on -one and set, set ground rules. You might be like, look, I'll work really hard, but I'm a nine to five person. If they say that's not acceptable to me, that's not a good advisor for you, okay? So you're, once you've been admitted, they want you, okay? That's your chance to like figure out all the negotiation you need to figure out. Till you've been admitted, you want them. Once you're admitted, they want you. Think of it that way, okay? Um, uh, I got some other sort of broader questions. Like, what if I, what do I do if I'm interested in multidisciplinary research? That's a great question. Um, there's not an obvious, so the thing is, multidisciplinary research was done extensively in the US and each institution handles it somewhat differently, okay? Even in the same subject, like if you take a subject like, I don't know, brain science or cognitive science, right? Which is very multidisciplinary. Each institution has a different structure. They might have a center. The center might give PhDs directly. The center might say to get a PhD, you have to go to have a home discipline. Then you have to meet the requirements of the home discipline. Each place is different. It's hard to give you general advice. What I would say is, again, once you've narrowed down the set of people who look interesting, go look at how it works at their institution. I know it's more work. Um, the sort of the pain of the American system is every place does its own thing. The beauty of the American system is every place is free to innovate and different people come up with different innovative models and they learn from each other and everything gets better as a result, okay? It's, it's a nuisance as an applicant, but it's an advantage also because that's how the system as a whole gets better. It's like independent evolution and everybody's learning and picking up things that they, they figure out, okay? So interdisciplinary, figure out each institution you're interested in, figure out, do they have a center? Do you have to apply to the center? Do you apply to the home department? Do you apply to both a center and a home department? Find out what, how that works at your place, okay? How do I expand the network of people I know in the field? That's a really great question. Um, it is increasingly the case that there are now mentoring programs in several areas, like PL Programming Languages, for example, has something called the C Plan M program, which is a mentoring program that started, that sort of thing is starting to happen in several areas. Um, <clears throat> there are regional conferences in different disciplines. Like if you're in the New England area, we have a New England programming languages, we have New England systems, New England security, New England architecture, right? So there are regional conferences. Use all of these ways to try to get to know people. There are also now virtual meetings like PL, for example, has something called PLT, T-E-A, which is like programming languages gathering. There are things like that. Uh, conferences these days are making it very easy to attend virtually for very cheap, if not free. So you can attend a conference and go to the social hours, those conferences, there are lots of ways to expand the network that didn't exist even two years ago. Take advantage of them, okay? Like that's the one good thing that maybe happened thanks to COVID. Are there services that will evaluate my application and tell me my chances of being admitted? There probably are. I probably wouldn't trust them, okay? I would ask them why they think they are qualified and what their track record is. How many people have they successfully evaluated? Out of how many? What's their, you know, make sure you don't fall for like base rate fallacies. I would be very suspicious, okay? Because I, like most of the information I read on the internet is wrong. So I don't know why some random service would necessarily have better information. They may be qualified, I don't know, at telling you about your undergraduate chances, but undergrad and grad are completely different, okay? Undergrad, all the stuff about like service and like you're a good human being and all that is great. Now, grad, I mean, we like you to be a good human being, please. But um, it's, it's like research driven. It's completely focused, right? The only person who can meaningfully be a proxy for me is myself. Maybe two of my colleagues at Brown. Nobody else has a good idea of my model of how I evaluate a folder. Certainly not some, you know, some dude sitting in New Delhi trying to put, hang a shingle out saying, you know, I'll evaluate your folders for like 50 bucks. So I wouldn't trust those systems. I don't know. Maybe there is one. If somebody thinks there is one that's trustworthy, let me know, but I doubt it. Um, let's see. Can I do research, uh, get PhD research in industry? Sometimes. 
Can I do PhD style research? Industry is sort of the opposite of academia, okay? You get lots of funding, you get paid well, and six months from now, your position may completely change. They're like, we killed that project, okay? Academia has continuity. We can think about things that don't have immediate market impact. We can think about like difficult, hard questions without worrying about having to produce a product in a year, okay? You can't do that in industry. So you can do all sorts of cool things in industry, but this is not probably not one of them. I do know some people who've done research, but it's a rare number of people. Most of the ones who do research in industry are people who already have PhDs. So take that for what you will, okay? Let me go back and look at some of the questions now. Um, let's see, if you worked at a reputed company, say a globe spanning multinational, will that help? Yes, it probably does. Uh, it gives us some credibility that again, if you can get a letter from them, uh, and you know, you you like it says that you work maybe on some interesting technology stacks rather than on boring technology stacks. But if you've done that anyway, no matter where you work, that's good to know. Okay, what's the approximate ratio of applications in machine learning to other areas? This is an interesting question. It seems to vary a lot by institution. Okay, so when you get to highly competitive universities, they are not dominant. They are significant, but they are not dominant. My sense is as you go lower in competitiveness, they are more and more dominant. I almost get the sense that faculty at some of the, you know, much lower tier places, much less competitive places are actually kind of hungry for good students because nobody's applying outside machine, no, good applicants are not available outside machine learning. That is not true at a place like Brown, okay? I, for example, personally get 20 to 30 really good applicants every year. And I don't look at anybody in machine learning. So this is just people applying to my area. And I think that's true of a lot of my colleagues. We get a lot of good applicants. When you have good students, look, there's a lot of computer science that's not machine learning. There's a lot of great stuff to be done. And interested students follow their interest rather than following the hot area. Because the hot area changes every five years. So if you pick the thing that is hot when you're a senior, almost certainly it's guaranteed to not be hot when you graduate with your PhD. Like 10 years later, it's guaranteed to not be hot, right? So that's kind of the dumbest thing you can do, following what is hot rather than following what you're interested in. Not to mention, you remember the curve that I drew, the dip? If you did something because it was hot, when you get to the bottom of that trough, you'll never climb back out of it because you'll be like, it's not even hot anymore. Why am I doing this? Okay, so good applicants follow what they're passionate about and good departments get students across the range. Um, if I have three short research inter internships have been translated into publications, how do I add credibility? Tell us what you learned. Tell us why it improved you. Tell us how it contributed to your learning that was separate from the learning you got from the university, how it broadened you, maybe how it gave you a sense of things you might be interested in doing in grad school, okay? There's a direct message here that says, could you tell us how we should structure a statement of purpose for professional masters? I'm not gonna answer masters. This is a PhD session. I don't actually do master's admissions. I don't feel like I know a whole lot about it. So I'm afraid I'm not gonna answer that, sorry. Um, which programming language a prospective student and PhD be proficient in? All of them. Okay, other questions. Okay, any other questions? What is the best way to explain my grades if I come from a foreign institution, different education system? Look, we know the foreign, we know most countries' educational systems and we can find out, okay? Yeah, we'll so if you want to provide, mm -hmm. sorry, could people mute themselves, please, if you don't mind? Um, if you want to, if you think there's something really important that we need to know, or if you're from a country that very rarely sends students to the United States, right? Then it might not hurt for you to give us a little sense of how to calibrate. It probably helps if you can get your professors to do that because they're a little more credible than you are, right? So if you can have a professor, like maybe a lead professor say, let me help you understand how to read a transcript at my institution or my country. And therefore this person's grades, even though they seem to have a 65% average actually puts them in the top 1% of students. That's really useful to know. It's more helpful if it comes from the professor than from you, okay? But if you can't get the professor to do it and you wanna do it, that's also fine, okay? Is NASTAR publication necessary to get into areas like CBML? I don't know, I sense is that, um, Essentially what's happened in machine learning is that every institution has moved one or two levels up in terms of competitiveness in that field, right? So if you have a low competitive institution in general, it's now competitive in machine learning. If it's competitive in machine learning in, in general, it's highly competitive, it's highly competitive, it's extremely competitive. That seems to be the sense. Um, I don't know enough about machine learning at uh, uh, highly competitive places, but I think 
I think people still get in who don't have papers, but they have to have something really exceptional. Okay, um, that's the best I can say. What are some student run programs that evaluate? Yes, that's a good question. Thank you. I did mean to say something about that. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, there are student programs. Brown also has a student run program that will evaluate your PhD application and give you some feedback. I think these are good. Uh, I would assume that there is some noise in the system. So it's certainly the case that at places like Brown PhD students do do an initial read of application folders. So they have a sense of application folders. Um, but I also get the sense that maybe they're not fully calibrated what the faculty are looking at. So I think these are useful. Um, don't take them 100%, but take any high level advice they give you that's certainly useful, okay? Um, for a PhD, can doing a master's help with a bad GPA and bachelor's? Yes, it can, especially if it's a master's from a place that's you know a decent place, right? Like if it's a place we've never heard of, uh, that doesn't really compensate. But if it's a place that we can have some trust in, or sometimes what will happen is a person didn't do very well in bachelor's, but then they went off and worked in industry for a while. It's clear that they sort of grew up as an, became an adult, went off and got a master's, and now they're in a much better position to be competitive for a PhD. That certainly makes a difference, okay? Uh, people sometimes go to other countries, right? So we've seen a pattern where students go to other countries, get a master's, you know, like if you're maybe from a developing country, you go to maybe a more developed place, you get a master's from there, and then you apply, that certainly makes a big difference because now we can, we have like more calibration. Ah, I didn't really talk about contacting professors, did I? Um, I'm sorry about that. Contacting professors is a very tricky business, okay? First of all, professors get a lot of email and they have only so much time, okay? If our, remember, our job here is to serve the students who are here, not the students who are not here, right? Anybody contacting us from outside by definition is not here. So um, we don't have a lot of cycles to spare for that because we're already pretty busy, right? We're teaching courses, we're advising students, we're doing research, we're serving on boards and whatnot. We have only so many cycles to spare. And, you know, people who are parents of children, like elderly parents to take care of, we've got our cycles are full. When you contact somebody, first of all, find out if they have something on the web that tells you how to contact them. If they do, and you don't follow those instructions, believe me, they are not gonna respond, okay? Um, I have instructions on my website. I tell people, I don't tell them where they are because I expect if you're a PhD student, you can please do that much of investigating. If you can't even find that, you're not gonna be a good PhD student if you can't read basic instructions. If you can't, if you read them, but don't follow them, it doesn't work, okay? So I have instructions and if people don't follow them or if they do them in the most superficial possible way, I can tell and I'm not interested in that person, okay? In fact, sometimes what will happen is they will say, contacted professor so-and-so, and then the folder will come to me and I'll say, like, really? I don't remember ever talking to this person. Then I go look at my email and say, oh, that person, yeah, not interested, okay? So that was a contact that actually hurt you rather than helped you, okay? If you are gonna write to a professor, keep it short, keep it focused, make it interesting. Remember, what are you asking them? Are you willing to raise half a million dollars for me? Okay, make it count. When a student who writes to me goes through the process that I asked them to and actually sends me something interesting, I will always respond and I'm super interested. Typically, most of my PhD students, actually not all of them, but many of my PhD students have come through that process where they've actually followed it and they've established prior contact. I'm like, wow, this is a person whose folder and I will send mail to my colleagues and say, I wanna keep an eye on this folder. I don't wanna lose this folder. I wanna at least read the folder when it comes in. Not necessarily gonna admit them, but at least wanna read the folder, okay? You can significantly improve your chances. You can also significantly hurt your chances, okay? If you come across as very superficial or you say like really, you know, you say silly things like I'm really interested in your, you know, cryptography because you are like, you're just not gonna get my attention. In fact, you've sort of confirmed that you've lost my attention. So does it help? Yes, it can. You won't necessarily get a reply. Doesn't mean they didn't need your message. Doesn't mean it won't have impact. I know that sounds like a very open-ended thing, but just keep in mind, right? If I were to spend my time re responding to email from like hundreds of people, right? Just think about how much of my time that would consume. I don't have that time, right? It's a little bit like what I did when I sent you the invite link for this, which is, like, 
please don't reply, right? Don't reply to say, yes, thank you, because I will not be able to handle that much email, right? There's an, there's an asymmetry here. There's a lot of applicants and a small number of faculty. And that asymmetry means like, I want to protect my time. Every professor wants to protect their time. At the same time, people are often interested in hearing from students who are good, right? I don't want to lose a good student. If there's a really great student out there, I would hate to lose them, right? So I want that half million to be spent on a really good student and the best student I can get is good for me, right? So if you can make a case to me that you're a really good student I should pay close attention to, I want to hear from you. If you can't make that case, it's just not worth anybody's time, okay? So it's a kind of ambiguous answer, but I think that's the best answer I can get. Are there any contact of a master's? I don't know. I doubt it helps very much. I don't know. But I'm giving you, this is a PhD session, so I'm going to give you the PhD perspective. Are there any questions about the contacting professors based on what I've said? First of all, did it make sense what I said? Give me a quick reaction. Okay. This sounds good. Based on what I said, what follow-up questions do you have about contacting professors? Does following up help? Uh, you mean like sending the same message multiple times? Probably not. Uh, I mean, you can send it maybe twice, but at some point, I, I have applicants who clearly have me on like auto dial. Like I have one who sends me an email message every week that doesn't follow my instructions, right? And they've clearly automatically programmed it to keep adding phrases. I'm like, dude, you're just like irritating the hell out of me here, right? So maybe if you did it twice, that's okay. You do it once and maybe a month later. Um, but beyond that, please don't. Don't irritate people because then it's like, you're sure to like not get in at that point, okay? Um, should we send email during working hours? Nobody cares, like it's email, right? You don't even know what their working hours are. So send email whenever you want, okay? Um, maybe don't send it over the weekend because they're not reading email. Maybe send it during the week, but during hours really don't matter. Um, should we mail to ask a professor to look out for my application after applying? Will that help? Well, do you have anything interesting to say? If you had anything interesting to say, I would have contacted them before applying and gotten them interested in your application. If you don't have anything interesting to say, they're not going to look out for your application. They've got like 100 people who could send them. Why are they going to look out for you? So if you have something interesting to say, make it count. Let me make a suggestion. On my contact webpage, I have instructions on writing good email. I link to one or two blog posts that I like a lot. And I also tell people how to reach me, okay? I don't want you to reach me unless you're actually interested in doing research with me. But the general instructions that I give there are useful for any professor, okay? So you can follow that as a template if you're not sure how to reach out. Follow the instructions on keeping the email short, clear, actionable. Follow the instructions on how to reach out to a professor. There's something very specific to me. You'll figure out what that is. Obviously, that doesn't make sense, okay? You can, you can even say, I'm following so-and-so's instructions if you want to. Nobody else will care. But make it count. Make it have substance. Remember that the person reading your folder is asking, do I want to spend a half million on this person, okay? Would you respond to an email asking about specific research topics? Me, personally, no, I'm not going to. I don't have time, okay? I, my time is devoted to the students at Brown. Brown pays me to deal with Brown students. This that I'm doing is also not part of my job, but I'm doing it because I think I wanna help with misinformation, but I'm not unfortunately unable to open myself up as a general information source. I do stuff on Quora once in a while, but uh, even that kind of Quora has gone downhill, so I don't spend much time on there, but I'm not able to help you with specific questions. And look, if you can't figure out the answers, Unless it's my research, which obviously, you know, then you're talking to me as a research person, as me, Sriram the researcher, not me as a general information resource. That's fine. Then you'll know how to contact me. You can follow the instructions. But general stuff, like if you're going to write to me about cryptography or something else, no, I'm not going to answer that. I'm not even qualified to answer that. And I already told you at the beginning of the session how you should ask those questions, right? Follow that stuff. Is talking to professor at conferences better than cold emails? Maybe, but... Um, be aware that when you go as a professor to a conference, there's like 30 people who want to talk to you. And invariably, there's that one person who gets overexcited and talks for like five minutes without taking a breath. And then that uses up all the available time. Okay. So don't be that person. If you have a concrete focused question, 
But I would say speaking strictly personally, in some ways, the email is better because you can write a few paragraphs and say something of substance. Don't write a long message, but you can say something of substance. Spend a while composing that message, okay? You're trying to ask somebody to build a lifetime relationship with you, right? Over a career, a person may have, you know, 10, 20 PhD students, right? So you're asking to be one of those 10 or 20 people they're going to build a lifelong career relationship with. It's okay. It's important to spend a few hours composing that message and getting it right. Okay. Spend the time. I would say for most people, the email might work better, but the conference can be a useful thing. You could reach out to the person and say, hey, I'm interested. But if you reach out and say like, look, here are questions that are pointless to ask. Okay. People ask, are you taking students? Or do you have funding? What do you think the answer that's going to be? Probably not, because you haven't yet convinced me you're worth half a million. Okay? First, convince me, then ask me the question of whether I'm taking on students. I'm going to have a very different answer. If I have an amazing enough applicant in my inbox, even if I don't have the money, I will go to my department and try to figure out how to raise money for you. Okay? I will go write a new grant if I have to to raise money for you. Okay? But until you've convinced me, I don't want to spend time on this, right? So it really comes down to time management and you making a case that the time is worthwhile. Does that make sense? I know it's not like the most positive, uplifting message I can make, but I want you to understand like what the life of a professor is also, because that's ultimately what determines some of these reactions. Can I get a quick uh, uh, reaction on this, making sure that I'm making sense? Good. Okay. What other questions can I answer for you? Feel free to type in uh, any other questions you have. Uh, masters, I, it's a question about where you can get information on masters. I'm afraid I don't know much. I don't know. But look, at some level, masters are much less competitive, okay? Because you are paying to attend. You're not asking them to pay you to attend, okay? So it's much less competitive. I would say you can take most of the things I said and cut them down, but master's is not fundamentally a research program, okay? If you're applying for a master's research track, that's a little different. You can imagine like half of what I said still applies, right? But the expectations are much lower. But even then, you're not typically expecting students to already come in doing research for a master's research, right? That's a PhD expectation, right? So, and most master's are like coursework based or project based. And those, you know, basically, are you going to be a good student here is all we care about. We're not evaluating on your research potential. We're not evaluating you on, this is very important, opportunity cost. What do I mean by that? As I said, a professor in their lifetime will have 10, 20 PhD students maximum. Okay. So out of the 10 or 20 strong people I'm looking at this year, I have to decide, do I want to admit one of these or do I want to wait until next year because I have like only this many slots in my life to fill up, okay? That's a very, very deep decision. A master's student, I'm not making any such decision, right? It's like undergrad admissions. They're gonna come in, they're gonna take some courses, they'll do a project and they'll leave. I'm not making a lifelong commitment to them, okay? So the stakes are much, much, much lower. I think master's admissions is way simpler. It's more like undergrad admissions. It's more, it's like a, a much more straightforward process. Um, undergrads with non-degree research experience have disadvantage over master industrial folks depends on the folder I can't tell you an answer to that it's going to depend on the details what are the research expectations somebody coming to the masters somebody coming from master or bachelors depends on the kind of masters you got we're certainly expecting to see that you did well on your courses in the masters um, if you did research that's great we would like to see strong letters at that point saying something about the research if you didn't do research that's probably fine uh, but we are expecting a degree of maturity in your statement, right? As an undergrad, we know there's only so much computer science you know. If you've got a master's in CS, I'm expecting you can talk more deeply about computer science. You can reflect the fact that you have a master's in the way you talk about computer science. Now, if I don't see evidence of that, that's problematic, okay? Um, what are the, if I'm applying for direct PhD, which is a thing you would normally do in the US, do I have to get a letter from home institutions? I have three other academic letters I wanna use. You know, 
it always looks a little suspicious when somebody doesn't have a letter from a place they spent a lot of time in. So if there's a really good reason why you don't want to get a letter from your home institutions, like, look, I spent the summers at all these great labs, and these people are much more research savvy than anybody in my home institution, and they're going to write about it. My home institution is not a research university. That's fine. But otherwise, unless you have a reason for it, it doesn't hurt to get one. But if you think like your home institution, people aren't going to write very good letters and you have really good letters from outside, that's fine. But just tell us why. Well, an advantage for student got a scholarship for their master's application. Uh, yeah, I guess if you had a scholarship for your master's, that can't hurt. But in the US, that would be exceptional because it's unusual for master's students to be funded. Elsewhere, it may or may not be. So if it's a prestigious scholarship, tell us about it. It means somebody looked at your folder and thought you were strong. That's good. Um, old strong letters versus recent not so strong letters. Uh, we want some of both. Old strong letters are good, but if they're really old, then there is definitely a bit of a question. But you know, if you were an academia, if you were in, in the university, then you went off to an in industry. It's good to get a current letter saying this person's still like you know good, <clears throat> but those old academic letters can still be useful. You need a mix of those. Okay. Other questions? Okay. If there aren't any other questions, I have one last question that I want to answer, which came in on uh, on on the form. So this will go. So I'll wait for one more minute, and then this will be my last question. I wanted to finish in two hours anyway, so we're getting to that point. Okay. Last one. Okay. Somebody wants to work on a different research topic. How should they approach potential supervisors? Um, yeah, you missed it. Uh, go back and uh, listen to the rest of the presentation, please. Okay. Here's the last question I'm going to answer. Okay. Somebody, I'm going to read the question literally, and I'm really glad you asked this question. Is the PhD really as scary and as daunting as everybody makes it out to be on Twitter? No, it's not. Twitter, I spend a lot of time on Twitter. Twitter is a hellhole, okay? And half the stuff I read on Twitter is just plain wrong, all right? So what I've noticed as a pattern on Twitter is that there are people who are basically the equivalent of influencers. They hold forth in great detail with great specificity about things they do not understand. But because they speak so forcefully, more and more people follow them. The more people that follow them, the more people that reshare, the more people that reshare, the more people that follow. So they suddenly become like authorities about things. I, I've seen, for example, there was somebody I, I saw who was making these really strong statements over and over, over several months about like PhD programs and about applications and research and all these other things. It was like, wow, everything this person says seems wrong. How are they managed to be so, how are we this disconnected? right? Not difference of opinion. There are people I have differences of opinion with. This person just like seems to be just wrong. I went and looked them up. I finally like Googled them to figure out who this person is. Like, I'm like, this is a professor at some profoundly different university than my own. And I would like to reach out and understand like how, how we're this different, right? Um, and I knew they were somewhere in Canada. So I was like, I know the Canadian system. It's not that far different from the, I mean, like not that different. Well, it turned out, no, 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 they weren't a professor. They were a PhD student at a pretty uncompetitive university who had one paper at that point in their entire career. They'd been a grad student for three years. They had one paper at a minor conference. And that was it. But on Twitter, they were an expert. Okay. Listen, most PhD students don't post on Twitter saying, today I had a pretty good day. Have you ever seen those? You don't see those. What does that tell you? There's a huge selection bias on Twitter, okay? You wanna provoke people, you wanna get people riled up. You say, man, everything is shit out there. It sucks, my advisor sucks, my PhD program sucks. The vast majority of students don't go through that. I was the director of grad studies for our PhD program at Brown for almost 10 years, okay? There were issues, I worked on those issues, I fixed some of them. I'm sure there were others I didn't know about or didn't fix, we made them better. But even at the beginning when things were not as good as they were at the end, students were generally doing fine. They were generally happy, doing good work, placing into good jobs, faculty, academic positions, research labs, industry, okay? And yeah, some things got better, maybe some things didn't get better, but generally people were doing fine. And I think that's true of most programs. I love being a PhD student. It was the best, it was like the most fun ever, okay? 
most professors you talk to will tell you that that was their favorite, favorite time because they got funded. They weren't paid a lot, but they had enough to live and they got like time to just work on interesting stuff. They didn't have committees. They didn't have duties. They weren't responsible to anybody else. They just got to work. Okay. There's a comment here that says drama sells more than truth. And that's absolutely true. And I, I want to be clear. It may be somebody's truth, right? That drama that they're pushing may be their truth that day. Maybe a little exaggerated, may not be, okay? There are problems and we should address the problems. We should be honest about the problems. We should not cover them up. We should address them. There are problems. Let's be honest about that. But it is not everybody's daily experience, okay? Because if it were, it wouldn't explain how everybody's like sticks around and actually looks back with pleasure. Okay, so we, for example, you know, we have a uh, we have an event every year where we bring our past PhD students back to give advice to the current PhD students. Okay, they don't say I don't want to ever see your university again. There may be some PhD students who are like that, and there is definitely some selection bias going on there as well, right? They are sorry, it's a survivorship bias, right? Because we're talking about the people who survived. We're not looking at the people who didn't survive. But even when the ones who quote unquote didn't survive, I don't even like that term, I'm using it because of survivorship, but it's actually a success for a PhD program. If somebody who decides they shouldn't be in a PhD program leaves in two years, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. It's much worse if they leave in five years, right? When they're completely miserable, right? You want them to leave early. We have processes in place for students to figure out if this is the right place to be because the admissions process is noisy. We, we get people through a noisy process. We want them to keep discovering. And if this isn't the right place, we want them to find out and move on. We're fr it's good for people to move on. It's not a disaster, okay? People read all kinds of things into statistics. They're like, oh, only 50% of students graduate with a PhD. Well, I don't know. Is that a bad number? Is that a good number? Where's the ground truth? Without a ground truth, we can't even tell if it's a bad or a good number, right? But when you consider what a PhD is, and you consider how noisy the process is of getting admitted, maybe it's okay, right? What I wanna know is what are the actual problems that need to be fixed? There are problems that need to be fixed and I wanna fix those. I'm not interested in sort of the Twitter drama, okay? There's a lot of total bullshit artists on Twitter. And um, as I said, you know, as, as this person said, drama sells more than the truth, but also in general, there's all these people who hold forth in great detail with actually very little experience, okay? And I've seen that on Quora as well. Many times I will answer, I used to answer a question on Quora because some random person would come along and have this very strong opinion, but not correlated with the truth, okay? So no, it is not as scary. It's not as daunting. It's actually a very systematic process. Most PhD students, I actually will say that in many ways, um, being excessively brilliant can be a problem because you may think like it's all about genius. Like movies do this terrible job of making us think research is this thing where, you know, it's like there's somebody stands in front of whiteboard and it's usually like some old white guy with like long hair who looks like a pseudo Einsteinish look kind of thing, right? It's always like a guy, right? And he stands there and he thinks really hard and then he shouts Eureka or he jumps up and scribbles some horrible thing on the board. And that's how research happens. And that's complete bullshit. That's not how research happens at all, okay? Research is a steady accumulation of, we're all bricklayers. That's what we are. We're building an edifice of science and it's a bunch of bricks and we're all laying a little brick here and there. Every one of my papers is a little brick. Some are smaller bricks, some are slightly bigger bricks, but they're all bricks. We're all just laying bricks on a wall, okay? For all the drama about how hard all this stuff must be, right? We all publish lots of papers every year, right? I mean, I publish some number of papers every year, five, 10 papers a year. It's not actually that hard. And my job is to teach my PhD students so that they can also do the same if they want to. If they don't want to, that's fine, but it's not actually that hard. Okay, steady, methodical work always wins. Yes, you need some ideas, you need some inspiration. It's not actually that hard. And that's what your advisors will help you with. Okay, did that all make sense? Right? My successfully combating Twitter here and my few moments that I have here, right? All the stuff about you must have recommendation letters, you must do this, you must do that. Most of these people don't know what they're talking about. That's, that's just all I can say about it, okay? All right. 
Uh, we've been here two hours. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. I wish we'd done this maybe more interactively, but it's a little hard to coordinate. And I, as you can see, I had a lot of stuff to get through. And so I apologize for the fire hose this is not how I like to run my classes, but the, this just seemed like the most efficient way to get it all. Uh, I'm gonna put this recording on uh, YouTube and I will let you know when it's there. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for the great questions and uh, thanks for spending time. It's really nice seeing all of you. And I hope I'll see you all as uh, students somewhere and I'll follow your careers and I'll learn a lot about the great things that you do. Good luck. Don't stress too much about it. It just takes time. Work steadily at it. Work your way up. Sit down. Think hard. Remember the guiding principle I gave you, right? The half million dollar guiding principle. Work your way through the guiding principle. Always ask yourself, am I making that case? What can I do to make that case? How can I improve myself in the next year to be able to make that case? Maybe I do some independent projects. Maybe I take some Coursera courses. Maybe I do all of the above. All of the things matter because that's what you're actually asking for. If you keep that in mind, a lot of things become clearer, okay? Good luck to everybody. It's good seeing you. Take care and I'll catch you online and maybe in person sometime. Bye-bye.